Welcome to the Vinny Rock Podcast. Podcast. I took the blow. This time, the Vinny Rock Podcast. The Vinny Rock Podcast would like to thank the following sponsors. Core Medical Group. Core Medical Group distinguishes itself as a prominent entity in the healthcare sector, specializing in offering innovative hormone replacement therapy solutions, which stand as a testament to their commitment to advancing healthcare. Core Medical Group values building enduring relationships and ensuring that each interaction is tailored to meet the specific needs of the professionals and institutions they serve. Learn more now at coremedicalgrp.com. GMR Gold. The Boolean Box by GMR Gold stands as the pioneering offering in the precious metals industry, being the first ever monthly subscription service for precious metals. It manifests as a seamless and innovative solution for those keen on diversifying their investment portfolios with precious metals, making the acquisition of gold, silver, platinum, and palladium uncomplicated and straightforward. To learn more and subscribe to Boolean Box, go to gmrgold.com. Everest.com Everest stands as the paramount independent outdoor marketplace founded by individuals with a relentless passion for the great outdoors. They are driven by a singular mission, to provision goods for every facet of the untamed and boundless wild, be it hunting, fishing, hiking, camping, survival, and more. So step up, immerse yourself in the diverse tapestry of outdoor life, and let Everest be your guide to transcending the ordinary and embracing the extraordinary in the world outside at Everest.com. Modern Gun School. Modern Gun School provides a tailored learning experience allowing you to study on your terms whenever and wherever it's most convenient for you. Their flexible open enrollment policy means you can kickstart your education for a career as a modern gunsmith immediately. Modern Gun School proudly accepts the GI benefit and vocational rehab, emphasizing their commitment to supporting veterans and individuals undergoing vocational rehabilitation. Embark on a journey of discovery and skill enhancement with their accredited program and carve your niche in gunsmithing with Modern Gun School today. To learn more and enroll, go to mgs.edu. Stay Classy Meats. Stay Classy Meats is deeply rooted in a reverence for time-honored traditions and enduring values. Working hand-in-hand with farmers and ranchers who share a mutual respect for these principles. Stay Classy Meats is not just a brand. It's a movement towards real food, a commitment to quality, and a journey to share a piece of Montana's unparalleled meat quality with the world. To place your order, visit stayclassymeats.com. Hey, welcome to the Vinny Rock Podcast. I'm with my boy, David Vibora. <laughs> um, I actually met him recently through another friend, Flo, who was supposed to be in the podcast, and I actually had a cancel on him. So he's going to be here hopefully next week or so. Um, but I was doing the men's wellness retreat, and then... We were looking for a guest speaker, Flo. We were trying to book Flo. He's a good buddy of mine as well, and he lives really close to where I do. And so uh, he said, dude, I can't be there. I said, just give me a name of one of your good friends who prob- probably would be able to make it. Um, and Dave showed up. And as soon as he stepped out of the car, I was like, holy shit, this dude's fun. So I Googled you a little bit, right? You know, I'm like, okay, cool. This is going to be dope. Yeah. I had no clue what you were going to talk about, but what you said was super impactful, and I knew right away. I was like, man, I want to I want to stay connected with you. Yeah. And and so uh, for me, it's it's an honor to have you onto the podcast. Yeah, thanks, brother. Man, I, something happened when you came to my gym. I said, look, you live as the destructor long enough, you watch yourself become the healer. Yeah. And that message was very clear that evening with all the vets that were represented. But as I researched you and your story, right? I mean, shoot, like. I mean, you're you're a Swiss Army knife of tactical operations, bro. Like yeah. you have done just about everything under the sun. And for guys like me that played in the NFL, really, like I wanted to hook and jab with bad guys like you have, right? Yeah. And you probably at some level, right? No, no, that's exactly that's something I've noticed throughout my years is all the professional athletes I became friends with, like they wanted my life and I wanted theirs, right? Yeah, yeah it's just what? like, and then we all wanted to be artists, right? Because we all, <laughs> yeah, we all wanted to do music, there, we all wanted to do music and be a rock band. Yeah, 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 that's so funny how yeah. that this is not the first time that conversation has actually happened, man. Yeah. And I think it's also why I connect really well with professional athletes uh, and as well as, I mean, the dichotomy of this is, is felons. 
Mm. We have all been a part of some kind of system and have had to come out of that system and find ourselves. Well said. And it's wild, bro. Yeah. It's wild because, yeah. uh, you know, Eric Coleman, former football player as yeah. well, he, he's a buddy of mine. We, we, he called me one time about the struggles of transition. He goes, dude, it, it was just as tough. Like, I hear, he hears veterans and, you know, the respect for, for football players and just professional athletes. They don't want to say, like, man, I know what you've going through because, because it's a scary thing yeah, to say. Yeah, the real battle right, 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 what right, you guys right. have done. But, but. Yeah, but at the same time, it's still the same experience. You know what I'm saying? And what you guys go through in, you know, hanging up the cleats, if you yeah. will. Yeah. Uh, it's the same thing we go through and, and the parallels of that are so similar that I think that's why we can relate to each other so well. Yeah, yeah. I think it's both, look, your identity, you're used to giving orders, taking orders, you're inside of this institution or structure yeah. and you're rewarded heavily for not just doing your job, but having the person to your right and to your left back. Yeah. And then you get out, the world doesn't operate like that. Right, right. Like right. Just, <laughs> yeah. and, and again, like we can be these, you know, you know uncommon sort of guys because we now can take those attributes and, and, and parlay them into business right. and into right. entrepreneurship and yeah. into platforms like this, right? Where right. it isn't about how much you've done or how little you've done, right? Like the idea that comparison's the thief of joy. Yeah. There's always going to be someone that, right. and yeah. there's always going to be someone behind you. Yeah. But it's about you recognizing that what you've been through is your story. First, you got to own it. Yeah. Then you got to use it. And the use, of, the use of it to me is to help somebody avoid a similar scar or at least the suffering narrative that they're in because of a similar scar. Yeah. And you know, it's what I've noticed is throughout the years, like working with veterans and law enforcement and just men in general is like, everyone feels alone. And then when they realize when you yeah. tell you, when you're willing to tell the story as vulnerable as you can fuck, like strip it down and ugly yep. where it's uncomfortable, they go, Oh fuck. That's dude. my story. Same. Well, that's what happened when I stepped out of the car at the light, the fuse retreat. Right. Y'all. So I didn't know what I was coming into either. Right. right? And I come in, you guys are already circled up. I pull the truck up like, the, you know, big old lifted F-150. I'm not going to surprise anybody <laughs> and step out. But what I heard, uh, Mike, I think was, yeah, it was name. Mike. Yeah. I mean, dude, I've this Mike Renegan, Mike Renegan. So Mike was telling my story through his experiences yeah. and it was through addiction and through this, the thinking that keeps us trapped, right? It may have got us to a certain point, but it can't get us beyond that point. Right. And so, I mean, whatever I maybe had planned just went out the gate because I'm like, man, I, I, I needed to be here to hear this. And yeah. I get goosebumps right now because how often do we talk ourselves out of something that's on the schedule or something that we have the opportunity to come and be real. Yeah. But that little voice in your head says like, Oh no, man, you can't do that. I know you sit in the parking lot and you come up with every little excuse. Like we, we pretend to be these big <laughs> macho men. And then the reality is man, like the part that I needed to share that, that, that night was, it was really just that there's no destination. We don't arrive. That was so valuable for me. It's like X's on a map, right? Land yeah. navigation, right? You, as soon as you get onto this X, you have to recognize you have to move to the next one. Yeah. And that's the part that I think that mental health healing is nonlinear. It's not just like, man, I'm okay now. And now I let off the gas. Right. That's the trap. That's the fucking thing that I never, dude, out of all the years of working on myself, trying to figure the fuck out. When you said that, I think I've posted that mm -hmm. two more times on top because I'm like, Fuck, because you think there's a finish line and you're like, oh, I've done my counseling. I'm good. I'm good. I'm done. I'm done. You know what I mean? Like, I don't fucking need it anymore. And then all of a sudden you're like, fuck, I, I'm starting to feel that type of way again. Yeah. I'm starting to feel the doom and gloom. Yeah. I'm starting to feel, you yeah. know, and when you said that, it actually brought so much clarity to my own life. Like, oh no, this is a journey I'm on, man. And I'm not, I can't stop. I can't stop because I don't want to digress to back to who I was. That's right. That's and right. so that was a fuck. When you said that, I was like, fuck. This, yeah. Bro. yeah. Well, it gets, I mean, again, I say it because I need to hear it. Yeah. You know, I think, look, you know, my, my short career in the NFL, I was Mr. Irrelevant. So yeah, yeah dude, explain that, dude. I thought, I thought the first thing I Googled, I yeah. saw, I was like, that's dope. It's, yeah. it, to me, it's dope as fuck. It's the underdog. That's it. It's I've always been the underdog, you know, from, I grew up in Oregon from high school to college. I had one division one offer at University of Idaho. So I wanted to play at the highest level. Dad was an Oregon duck linebacker. Oh, cool. So I went on to be a vandal. You know, four years there, eventually had a breakout season my junior year. When it comes to the draft, it's an imperfect science, right? right? Like it's, it's you know, maybe you're a fifth round pick, whatever. I knew I wasn't going to be an early pick. Eventually the draft rolls on and on and on. I think most of my friends were drunk and passed yeah, out. Yeah, they're all sleeping. You're yeah. like, oh my God, are they going to call my are name? Are they going to call my name? And, and at some point late in the draft, sometimes it's better not to be drafted. You can be a free agent and pick a fit that maybe yeah. you make the team at a better opportunity. And um, it was like right before the last pick and someone in the room said, you know, I heard the last pick wins a car. And I'm like, what? I've, I've been driving a moped at school in Idaho, like bro, in the snow with my feet down, like hard oh, sliding shit. into spots. <laughs> 
Um, and so I was like, that'd be cool. We looked it up and there was this whole Mr. Irrelevant thing, right? That the, the last pick shall be treated like the first. There's this big, they fly you to California, um, you know, VIP treatment, parades, Disneyland. I went to the Playboy Mansion, had dinner with Hugh and then the girls. This was back when he had the three chicks. Remember the show? Oh, yeah, 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 that show. Uh, yeah. What was it? I don't even remember what it was called. Uh, uh, Playmates or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But, but got to sit and watch movies with him and hang out. So, like, again, you can call me Mr. Anything You Want, right? Like, the guy that got drafted before me and me, we had the same pretty much signing bonus. Yeah. And so it was week one in rookie camp. And I remember going to the Rams and um, I'm pretty sure no veteran player was in the building. Yeah. And like, they found me like taking a piss. Like, Hey, Hey, you I don't even know if they knew my name. The community relations was like, we need someone to go talk to at elementary school real quick. Can you go? I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll go. And so on the car ride to this school, I was thinking, dude, what am I going to, like they needed Steven Jackson. Or yeah. Like, right. Kurt right. Warner or these guys. And it was amazing. And this is really what shifted my focus even beyond football now, which was, I said to these kids, I said, look, how many of you guys have ever been the last pick at something? Hands shot up. I said, well, dude, I was the last pick on Sunday night. It's not going to stop me. It's not going to stop you either. So what I did in that moment, which wasn't pre-planned, it was just. You told yourself that. I told myself that. <laughs> well, look, look. <laughs> I was speaking to myself. And then when I heard it, I was like, that's really good. And the truth is, it's about playing the hand that you're dealt. Yeah. And that to me is the underdog is a person's like, just give me the foot in the door. I'm going to run through that thing. Damn. And so, you know, becoming a starter rookie year was something that Mr. Relevance don't do very right. often. And then, you know, I had a, I had three years with the Rams, two years with the Seahawks, but back to the identity crisis, right? Yeah. Like, you know, what started easily, you can write it off as prescriptions and injuries right. and stuff, but nah, man, I was just scared to know who David was without the game of football. Yeah. Numbing, numbing, eventually seven day detox, you know, puking, shitting all over myself, seizures, like a bottom where it felt like, I just failed and there was nothing I had to offer. Yeah. If you would have asked me in that pit, I would have told you I have nothing to offer. And th you were in the NFL. Is this happening or when in you in the NFL? Holy in shit. fact, after the worst night of my life, the night three of detox, the next day, this male nurse comes into my room and like slings this like curtain open. I'm like, yeah. like, like a know, movie. Like, yeah. yeah. And he's like, okay, so uh, now that you're feeling better, I guess you should get up and go encourage some of the other people. And you know, back then my ego, I was like, well, what if they recognize me? Yeah. Dude, you got a heroin addict. You got a cocaine addict. They are not worried about whether I play for the Seattle Seahawks, yeah. right? And that was the first look at, again, like my old thinking that was really limiting in the fact that I had defined myself solely as this thing that I did. Yeah. My extrinsic worth, value, motivation was all in that. Yeah. It wasn't from, well, who's David without the game of football and where right. do those skills apply to help people? So the, the process from that point on was really just like, okay, if the things that made me talented at football could be transferred, like, you know, tactical stuff's interesting, right? Like shooting a 50 cal, not a lot of places you're going to use that in civilian theft, right. right? Unless right. you're out of the range right. or doing, right. doing black rifle stuff like, yeah. like you guys yeah. do. Yeah. But for me, it was like, I can't go and unless I'm coaching, me teaching somebody cover two doesn't matter. Right. So it was about what were those attributes that made me great in football, made me a great teammate. Right. What was it to bring my charisma and enthusiasm no matter what the scoreboard said? And really, like, you know, help people see that, you know, their perceived disadvantage was maybe, in fact, the qualifying factor for them to take that next level. Dude, it's it's the same exact idea that you want to get through to veterans and and just anyone. Like, I have, uh, you know, this male group, and, and there's men that are just like, dude, I don't know what to do next. Like, dude, do the same thing you've been doing. It's yeah. the same skill set. Like, anyone in the military has got out of the military. Like, like, I was an Army Ranger, and I remember, like, trying to create my resume – and Arm Ranger, like for me at the time, the ego, I'm like, fuck yeah, everyone's gonna respect this, yeah, right? And, yeah. and the truth of the matter, no one really gave a fuck. The first job mm. I had, uh, the the prison guard, uh, the the interview, he goes, oh, you were a park ranger in the military. How did that work? And I was Stop like, it. I'm sorry, what? I think you did yeah, that on yeah. purpose. In, I bet you, no, did. dude. Oh, he actually straight just up, took just it didn't know. Oh. Yeah, and so I was like. Fuck me, right? Because there's such a disconnect. Like in my world, we were we were, we were the top dogs, right? right? But yeah. in the civilian world, like just the fact you served, people respected that. Sure. And I couldn't, I couldn't dissect that. It just hurt too much to understand that. But like, so trying to create my resume, I'm like, dude, I don't know how to put this into words, man. Like, like kill or capture a high value target. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it doesn't work, dude. Yeah. Yeah. But then like. What I have done in my life to put myself in a position to be now in Hollywood as a writer, as an actor in the highest of levels, yep. is the same thing I did to fucking pass Ranger School, same That's thing right. I did to pass all these different selection courses, That's whatever right. the case. And it's like, if I can get other people to understand that shit, like yep. they would have the same success in their own world. Yep. 
Like, if someone was successful in the military, you could be successful fucking anywhere. But it takes people like you to give people the permission slip. And the and some level of it's like it's like you speak Japanese the you know the civilian sector does not well you need a translator and that translator is oftentimes you recognizing that like you know how to lead in in fluid situations and you know other people are going to look to you naturally right like that to me is a consistent across the board regardless of branch of duty and so it, it's really about like are you the type of person who's looking for work are you the type of person that is waiting for orders. Like I see some guys, you know, some military guys that, you know, those that get out and are waiting for orders. Yeah, it's I know. A slippery slope. You yeah, know? yeah. It's it's as soon as you get stagnant, you get lost, and when you get lost, you start questioning everything. And you're just, idle time, bro. Devil's playground. Yeah, yeah. It's, and again, yeah. the things we used to celebrate, right? Like getting fucked up and and having these things. Like at some point, man. Like, is that what we're about anymore, dude? It took it takes so long for the culture of who we are to let go of that side of us. It's because you feels like if you like for us as an army ranger, the ranger community is always like we, we fuck, we fight, we 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 drink. Right. That was our world. We're like Rawr, ranger, ranger. Yep. And you're like, all right, cool. But no, nah, bro, like I'm a family man, dog. That's like, right. <laughs> you're right. like, like I got kids. Bro. I yeah. can't be that dude. Yeah. But it's so hard because when you don't, you feel like you're alienating yourself yeah. from your own brotherhood. And yeah. it's a really hard transition. It's the same. It's it's just same veterans. Veterans all I get dudes. I'm sober now four years and it's like four months or something like that. Right. Let's go. Boom. And uh, I still to this day get guys like, dude, I'll buy you. A drink. I was like, oh, I'm sober. They're like, oh, really? Yeah. And it's like, so it's like what? Like what? Yeah. You're, it's 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 not common to see guys going into that route like yeah. i chose sobriety because i chose sobriety it wasn't I, I can't say that i found myself like really genuinely in this dark place where i needed it but i knew that I, it controlled me yeah that's my it. whole life it, the question that anyone that's listening i say this all the time it's are you using it or is it using you yeah you know and we know the difference yeah. if we're really rigorously honest man we yeah. know the difference yeah. right and and i think the I think I used this when I spoke at your thing, right? I heard that alcohol, somebody, this quote, this is not me, this is off uh, Instagram or something, but uh, drinking alcohol is like borrowing tomorrow's joy and tomorrow never comes, right? At some point, it's like, I'm looking to heighten my state and at what level then does that actually remove what's possible for tomorrow? Yeah. And that's the piece that like, I was just, I was, I was wholeheartedly cutting off the spiritual speed dial to my higher power and again, like I, I grew up in church, yeah. like my faith has been very important to me, yeah. but I, at some point through addiction, it shifted from what am I supposed to value versus what do I actually value? Right. And once I started asking those questions and challenging my belief systems, that's when it actually enriched my faith. <laughs> it, it got me deep enough to question whether I actually believe that or that was just something my parents instilled. Yeah, no, me. that's an important part of like your faith. That's funny. I never thought we'd even talk about this, but I... That's such a big part of like finding your your path in faith is actually knowing what you've believed and what you've come to believe and not that what was given to you and feed it to you. Big time. Once you figure that out, it changes how you see it all. Yeah. yeah. Well, here's a question for you. Do you know your great great grandfather's first name? Uh no, I don't. Uh it great grandfather, maybe? Maybe, yeah. 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 So point being is like we again, this idea of leaving the legacy and doing right. all these things, like, yeah, we love our family, that's important. But in reality, in three generations, no matter what amazing stuff you've done, it probably gets forgotten. Yeah. So what that tells me is like, dude, you have one life. You have one shot at this thing. And really to, to, to point about, you know, army ranger veterans in general, people like they acknowledge it, but don't really care. Right. Like the same thing is true. Like your trauma is not special. Right. It's not man. Absolutely. Like it, it is. You're going to have to recognize that those are the factors that hopefully enabled you to grow from a perspective once you realize that the old way wasn't working. Yeah. And that's a playbook that again, like, you know, I don't care if it's definition of insanity, you know, trying to do the same thing over and over and you get the same result. Like at some point we run in that brick wall long enough that there's someone like a Rocco that says like, Hey brother, what if I was able to give you a rope? Like, yeah. And this rope is something that you're going to have to climb. I can't do it for you, but I'm going to be here on the other end of it. Yeah. And once you get up here, like I'm going to show you how, how good it can be. It's wild, dude. When I try and like introduce people to like different wellness modalities, and you can tell they're like, oh, no, no, bro. I'm good. I'm good. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I was there, dude. I did the same. I remember someone telling me, like, maybe I should stop drinking. I'm like, what the fuck? I don't, I don't trust a dude who doesn't drink. That's that, it. It's coming out of my own mouth, bro. Yeah. And I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. And now I look like, man, that was as much as I thought I was a very mature person at the time in my life. I was very still successful, special operations, border patrol at the time. Um, I now look at that guy and be like, you idiot. Yeah. You fucking idiot. Yeah. yeah. And, and. 
thank God I'm aware that I don't have to do that anymore. Right. You know, cause that's the other thing. It's like, it's freedom from, but it's freedom for. And to me, the freedom from whatever was keeping you stuck or stagnant or, or stymied. Now all of a sudden it's freedom for new things. So take away the destructive habit, put it, install a constructive one. You may surprise yourself. And then through that path, you may actually discover that, you know, shit, man, I, I thought that, you know, all the things that, made me feel uncomfortable and weak and vulnerable. Those are actually the superpowers. Mm -hmm. And once you tap into those, man, that's a part of your truth that then you may be surprised how many people actually align with you and how many people also say, bro, like not only have I been through that, but here's what I use. And then you're like, dude, let me, I want to brilliantly borrow that. Yeah. I want to brilliantly well, borrow that. Yeah. That's kind of like the path I've been on is soak up as much information as fucking possible. Put myself through as many modalities as possible and be the guinea pig for all those who are kind of nervous or scared to take that, take that step. You're doing it, man. We're done. We're trying. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's, you know, the, I don't care if it's plant medicine. I don't care if it's ice, you know, ice baths or, or breath work or otherwise. There's so many different things that we see out there that people, you know, or they try them once. Yeah. It's like, it's like, it's, it's the fruit of consistency always. Yeah. And, you know, my breath work meditation, you know, practice, I use an app and I obviously has stats, but I just was curious the other day and looked at it. Over the last four years, I've done over 1,200 hours wow. of meditation and breath work following this app. What's that app? Do you mind? Insight Timer. It's a free app. It's concierge-based, so you can choose you know, guided or not guided, music or not music, um, you know, the whole host of things that are sort of themes. Yeah. If you're feeling panicked, SOS style, you can click on yeah. that one. Yeah, people don't understand because sometimes, uh, I guess, our, our communities don't respect the breath work thing because they kind of think it's foo-foo or weird. Mm -hmm. But firsthand, I am the same. I was one of those guys too. It was like, no, nah, dog, sure. it's cool, but it's not for me. Yeah. Like if I'm behind a rifle, like totally different. Because <laughs> yeah. we ask our vets when I come into my gym, it's like, have you ever done mindfulness? Like, God, no, man, fuck that. <laughs> okay, have you ever had to control your breath and be aware of your heartbeat when you're behind the scope? Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. actually you're better at mindfulness than you think you <laughs> yeah, are. Bro. You've actually do you've it. You've done this. Yeah, you've, you've done, done this. this. In very stressful situations, yeah. you've done this. So you've proven it then. So tell me why you can't do it when somebody cuts you off on the tollway. Yeah, bro. It's crazy. So I, uh, I, my buddy, he, he's a, the owner of American Yogi. His name's Phil. Really, I'm has to introduce to him. He's cool. super, super yeah, dope. I, I was on set in Mayans, bro. And I was going through a heavy, heavy scene that I was preparing for. So emotionally, I was already putting myself and I'm practically new at acting compared to all these other senior right. dudes. So I don't know how to turn it off and turn it on as well as these guys. I'm actually learning that process. And so in that process, I'm super emotional. My wife texts me every morning when she's taking the kids to school. And that morning she did it. And she, and whatever reason why. Yep. And I said, um, is everything okay? She goes, oh yes, babe. Sorry. Good morning. It's busy, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, my head took me to place. Like, does she not care? Uh -huh. is, like, am I working <laughs> so hard over here doing everything I can for this family gone for them? It's like an away game for you guys. Yeah. And like, it felt, and it felt like there was, are we, is are, are things not good? Do you not? think about me in the morning anymore am i not the first text it. and it start and the drive i started like fucking freaking out in my head like i do all this shit for them and do they not appreciate me anymore and it just got me bro it really fucked my head up and i'm thinking about this scene it was just seen as so much similar to the same thing i'm losing a family in this fucking thing i'm mm. the, the mix of it all right i'm i'm deciding to walk away from my son on the show okay and so, spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so it fucked me up i was having this family issues in my head you know and I got to set, and I'm the first scene, and I'm fucking bawling, bro. And I can't shut it off, dude. Yeah. So I tell the fucking uh, executive producer, I said, um, I don't know what to do. I'm fucking crying, and I'm like, man, I feel like I'm going through a depressive state. I can't fix it. I called Phil, and I said, Phil, I know you do breathing. I've never done it, dog. Um, I'm going through, through yeah. it right now. He goes, you in it right now? I was like, I am, dude. And I'm like crying, right? He goes, all right, bro, um, put your phone on speaker. Go breathe with me. He puts some music on, starts breathing. Bro, 20 minutes later, I feel the tears dry up. Straight up. Like, I feel them dry. And yes. I was like, what the fuck? Yeah, and I said, Phil, I got to go, but what the fuck happened? He goes, dude, you just reset your, your brains. That's yeah. all we did. Yeah. And I, I couldn't believe it, dude. Yeah. So after that, I'm like, dude, I'm a fucking believer, dog. Yeah. And yeah. after that, it's been, I've been trying to incorporate that into my life. Well, that's what's so key, man. So, you know, I mentioned my gym, right? So I retired. I got out of the league in 2012. I uh, was living in Orange County, surfing every day. One day my wife's like, okay, so uh, what are we going to do next, right? Yeah. And I said, look, the gym is always a sanctuary for me. It was where I could take hard work to achieve for moderate talent. And, um, you know, I said, I think I need to start a gym and help train athletes and help give them not just the physical stuff, but this mindset thing as I've overcome addiction and overcome some yeah. of these own demons. Um, and, and through that process, I met Staff Sergeant Travis Mills. Yeah. So I'm at a surprise birthday party for Clint Bruce, Navy SEAL, a good friend of mine. Uh, actually, the place where this whole thing happened at his birthday, and, and Travis is there, and I walked right up to him like, dude, when was the last time you worked out? 
He's like, dude, I want to make you feel like an asshole. I don't have arms and legs. What do you mean? <laughs> and like, fair. But again, I think as a man, as a human, we need to tap into our physicality no matter whether we have arms and legs. Yeah. And know that we can also stand at a ready, even if the ready looks different. Right. And so, you know, through Travis, then I had two vets, then I had 10 vets, all these guys missing limbs, spinal cord injuries, different things. And I couldn't manage my for profit side anymore because I cared solely about these guys. Yeah. And so in 2014, decided to start a nonprofit, Adaptive Training Foundation at ATF, so to speak, the good ATF. <laughs> uh, so we, we <laughs> forgive me any of these uh, alcohol, tobacco, <laughs> firearms folks that are probably listening. One of my good buddies yeah. like, ah. yeah, yeah, love you. <laughs> uh, but, but the gym runs a nine week redefined program. So we fly them here, we house them, we feed them. It very much mirrors what I did getting ready for the NFL, the combine training. Yeah, cool. And so it was like, look, you just come to work. Let us do all the worrying. You don't have to think about anything. You just come with attitude and effort. And I was watching these guys through, you know, the sweat equity. The steel doesn't care what your skin color is, what your background yeah. is, how much money's in your pocket. And I was watching them through sweat equity just galvanize their relationships just like it was in the military. And then I was watching as we started to implement things like breath tools. And guys were open up about certain things. Like you, they were like, what the fuck? What happened? Yeah. Where did I go? I went somewhere. I didn't. But the, what we're doing here is we're governing our nervous system. So fight or flight response, you know, the sympathetic state is like hypoxic breath. So yeah. before every workout, our adaptive athletes, they do uh, different diaphragmatic hypoxic breath work. They're stimulating their nervous system to get into that fight or flight. And then after their 90 minute session, they go back in that room and now they're doing like a box breath, a parasympathetic yes. state to get them into rest and digest. So just giving them those tools, like I'll give a tool to anyone listening. The next time you feel spun out, you feel sweaty palms, a racing heart, you know, emotional, over emotional, all of this, these sort of just triggers. I want you to immediately check yourself, find five things that you can see. Say them out loud if you have to find four things you can feel. Right, maybe it's the air on your skin. Maybe it's the hair on the back of your neck, your toes and your socks, whatever it is. Then you find three things that you can hear. Just stop for a second, get still and listen. Two things. Hopefully they smell okay. Then one thing, what's the inside of your mouth taste like? Take a deep breath. And welcome back to the present moment because the brain is a tool that can use us or we can use it. In the amount of time it took you to go five, four, three, two, one with your senses, you've grounded yourself in the present moment and you've interrupted the thought pattern that had you spun out. So again, our feelings and emotions are patterns that take hold of us. But if we can redirect our thinking, what happened to you on set and that whole pathway with the wife and all that, the stinking thinking yeah. that popped up, right? We all have that little voice in our head. And when the stakes are high, it gets loudest. Yeah. And so if we can, inside of my gym, put them through growth producing fear encounters where their heart rate goes up, we see how they react under stress. Then we can unpack it later once they're down in that rest and digest. And they can go, man, I see what happened here. Now I can become a conscious responder rather than an unconscious reactor. I don't care if your kids are pissing you off, your yeah. wife is, you're gonna be a better human. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the, again, the tools back to modalities of healing until you can be willing to explore things that make you feel uncomfortable, right? Like doing the things that we're really good at, yeah. slanging steel around, doing that part. That's not the hard part. Circling up and talking about the time when you tried to take your life or the time that, you know, you were driving 140 on the freeway and didn't care if it ended. Those are what we need to get to because that's the root of the the real issues. Right. Bro, I, I, I absolutely agree. I love, uh, I want to go down there and work out more often. I want to, I want to spend more time there. So yeah. I'm going to try and find my schedule to, to shift a little. So on Wednesday, Wednesdays is mainly when they meet right Monday, now. Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 1030 to 1230. If anybody's in the DFW Metroplex and wants to come visit, reach out to Adaptive Training online or on social. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the energy. What, what did it feel like coming in there? It was dope. One, the, the couple guys knew who I was. So I felt like, oh shit, that's cool, man. It always feels good to know, like I, I'm yeah. still reaching the veteran community. Yeah. And then two, just to see everybody in there all working together, it's like a it's like a really cool family, man. It was yeah. cool to see the the. Yeah. I was intimidated to work out because I was, man, I'm gonna fall out of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was humbling. Look, it looked good, it man. Is, it's is I always describe it as almost like a like a church foyer after a wedding, yeah. right? Where people, I mean, again, there's hugs and there's people that are welcoming you, but then when it comes time to work, bro, it's locked in. We're focused, yeah. And the whole sweat psychology of it is, you know, going back to that little voice. We all have an imposter syndrome. Yeah. We all have that, man, am I a fraud? And, and as soon as we put that in the light, then it loses its power over us. So it's as much about them from the extrinsic 
you know, what am I, what are people, what am I supposed to look like? And, or where is it that I inherently say, man, no, this is intrinsic. I'm doing this for me. Yeah. I'm not doing this because, you know, I like, I get it. When people lose a limb, people notice, and obviously the brain seeks symmetry. And so when it doesn't see it, there's often people stare, but I call that pressures a privilege. You have an opportunity then, you know, when, when president Bush came to the gym, when W came, he said the same damn thing that I say to him, which is that exact factor. Your greatest lead is that your greatest opportunity as a leader is actually in front of you, even though you're not wearing the uniform anymore. Yeah. These guys that were wounded, people are going to ask, man, what's your story? Yeah. And you can either be the bitter, angry, yeah. hardened veteran and make them feel less than you yeah. just don't understand. Yeah. Right? At some level, do you want them to? Right. Like, nah, right. man. Like, yeah, uh, it, yeah. It, you didn't, you didn't do it. So they feel the pain of it. Yeah. And so that's where the shift comes. And it's recognizing that man trauma is guaranteed for all of us at different levels. And it's not about you marginalizing somebody else's or, you know, sensationalizing yours. The trauma Olympics thing that you see in the veteran community is ripe with it. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's the handout thing rather right. than a hand up. Absolutely. I mean, what is so cool about the gym is these vets that have come through and come through the process, they come back as trainers. So yeah. now we're hiring them and over 30 of them have moved them and their families here once they've gone through a program. Damn. Which is proof in the pudding, man. Like, yeah. And that's the thing. I may have trained 100 amputees. I'm not an amputee. Those closest to the issues are best to serve. Right. And best to have an opportunity to pay that healing forward. Yeah. And that's the proof. So like, I can't regrow your leg. So don't wait for that. <laughs> I, I want you to see that the opportunities ahead of you are actually the parts of your qualifying factors, not the disqualifiers. <sighs> What's your... Uh... What's your best memory as a kid? Man, I remember the first time I beat my dad in horse. <laughs> you know, when you beat yeah, your old man. Big, man. And dude, my feet didn't touch the ground all night, maybe the next week. Because my dad, a great athlete, um, very quiet man, very different personality than yeah. me. But a lot of uh, the characteristics of leadership and the things that I learned. He comes from three generations of Marines. Yeah. Uh, my grandfather fought in three wars, uh, flew in three wars. It was 31 years, Lieutenant Colonel in the Marine Corps, air winger. And, um, you know, they did not say, I love you. Hard mm. stop. Like that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And so it's also for me to recognize that with my son, who's three, I have an innate opportunity to break a cycle. Absolutely. And that's the thing is it's like, bro, if it, it, look, my dad did his best. Yeah. And I don't fault him at all. Like, I, I recognize today that like he did his best with what he had. Now it's about me not judging him for what he didn't do, yeah. but me filling the void for those areas that he didn't. Absolutely. Dude, I had a conversation with my daughter about, she's in college. She's at Ohio State, right? She's about uh, to graduate. Go Bucks. Yep. She's about to graduate and she's, she's applying for uh, law school. And we get into this argument about like pay of college. And, and I, at the time I like, dude, I couldn't afford paying her full tuition, everything. So we got into this, like not even an argument, just like a discussion. It was actually one of our like best adult versions of discussions. And I try to explain, it was like, look, I'm still learning all this stuff, yeah. dude. Like I am like, and like, I, I don't, I didn't have like, my dad isn't the type I could have asked about this either. Right. My dad's cool. I love my dad, yeah. but like, that's not the subject we talk about, right? We also don't talk about emotions. <laughs> I came home from one of my scenes. I was emotional. He goes, and my mom goes, how was it? I was like, I was good. It was emotional. He goes, oh, all you guys do is cry. And I was like, what? Mother I'm an actor. <laughs> yeah, I'm acting. I'm on set, bro. <laughs> this is what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. And so that's the same. He's got that generation. But with that generation comes like, he only knows what he knows. And he only can give what he knows, you know? And he, he my dad, I, I, I just never thought about this, this time in my life. It's so tough. And like, I don't go to him for these kind of things. Not like he wouldn't have good answers, but it's just, I just, mm -hmm. I just know it's not none he's experienced, dude. And, mm -hmm. and I think about like how he was raised with his dad, you know what I mean? And so it's like, yeah, we have to stop the cycle at some point. We all, we, all we have to do is identify like, okay, I didn't like that so much. And so I won't do that, yeah. you know? Yeah. And then when they raise kids, they're going to find things, their kids are going to be like, I don't like that that much. Yeah. So I won't do it. Let's say it this way. No one's going to screw your kids up more than you. <laughs> <laughs> like even if your best efforts, yeah. right? Like yeah. that, that's the thing. It's, it's guaranteed that it's about catching yourself in the moment and or course correcting, right? right. Like the other day, my eight year old talked back to my wife. Mm -hmm. I mean, bad. Boom. And it was for me, right when the switch happened, I, I walked over to her. I picked her up physically and I walked her into the garage away from mom and yeah. I planted her down. And I said, listen, first of all, you're going to go back and you're going to apologize to your mom. Second, this never happens again. Let me tell you blah, blah, blah. Now that all went down. She apologized. There was a thing. Then that night I'm laying in bed. I'm thinking to myself, rock dude. Okay. You didn't have to pick her up. I get it. The truth was, is I chose to do something that was disruptive yep. in that moment to, to for her to 
There's yeah. a little shock value. Yeah, yeah, Again, absolutely. Didn't hurt her. Certainly no. never laid hands on her. No. But I realized, hey, that's something daddy has to clean up. Yeah, because for her, that was probably the most physical thing you've done. And that is a, the scale of like, oh, shit. Oh, right. shit, right? Yeah. And so that next morning, and again, yes, she had slept and otherwise. But the first thing I did was give her the biggest hug and say, hey, I want to tell you I'm sorry if that scared you. Because daddy didn't want to scare you. I did want to course correct your attitude and, and yeah. your, your acts or your actions. But um, just know that, you know, I won't do that again. And you know what? Now it's for me to not do it again. Right. right? So the next time something's triggering or otherwise. But point being is, man, be quick to clean up your side of the street. And the more you do that, the more you become aware of it. Yeah, and I think it's good that you apologize. I think there's a lot of parents that think they're not supposed to. Like, no, no, no you're, you're human as fuck. Yeah. Say sorry. If you fucking, if, me and my wife at night are like, oh, God, are we too hard? Did we do, should we, you know, oh, yeah. oh, you know, and then in the morning you're like, well, let me fix that. Like, hey, kids, let's talk. You know, the, you know, when we moved, we made, me and my wife made a discussion at night. I'm like, look, here's what I'm thinking. Like, we're done with minds. We're done with this. There's, in Utah, we didn't have this connection to any friends, personally, me and my wife, that we felt like, like, this is home. It yeah. kind of still felt alienated from our little world because just the city that we lived in, it was just weird. Yeah. We had some friends, but again, it was something about like, we want to go home. We were ready to go home. And so we made that choice. We didn't talk to them about it. Didn't feel like I needed to. Right. Then in the morning I said, hey guys. And they were like, Barrr. you know, all mad and hurt by it. And I was like, damn. And I talked to my wife. I was like, are we wrong? It's like, <laughs> no, but you know, in the end of the day, we always say like, wherever we we're together, we're together where our family's fine. You know, wherever we choose to, to live, our yep. family's together, we're good. That's yep. a win. But we made a choice because we think it would be best for the family. And um, I felt bad after like, dog, they're going to hate me forever. You know what I mean? But for sure. I don't know, man. You make the decisions you make because in well, wholeheartedly we believed it was the best for the family. But but you know they'll they'll have their opinions on it in the future. And we'll see. You One know thing I mean? I'm realizing with my kids is although I brought them into this world, well, I, my wife beautifully brought them <laughs> into the world, and I had, I had the hard part on the front end. But uh, <laughs> but you know we don't own them, right? Right. I think at some level we have a lease with them or a lease on them you know, till they get to that adulthood. And yeah, maybe that's 18. Maybe it's a little before that, depending on whether you're making the age specific, but you know, it's, it's less about me saying, well, I'm the parent. So that I said so. Yeah. And more about them understanding the thinking and the difficult decisions that come into. Yeah. And that's the point is like, look, I think, you know, now there's going to be opportunities moving forward where you can include them more on the front end. But even when you don't, right, like you can also explain the reasoning and thinking behind you why you didn't. Yeah. And that's the thing. They may not understand it right now, but they're going to understand it in time. Oh, yeah. I understand my dad all the time now. Uh, now yeah. that you have kids, you're like, oh, I get it, dad. I get it. I get it. This parenting and adulting is hard, man. What's your, uh, what's your worst memory as a kid? You know, when I was 10 year old, uh, I shared this at the light the fuse thing. Cause you know, it, it's a part of my story. That's a scar that was dealt really deep. And I think it's, it was not just defining for the way I approached everything in life post, but when I was 10, the neighbor boy who I, um, deeply it, it admired and respected, um, he sexually abused me, man. And that, that, uh, that left me so confused. I felt so broken. I felt so <sighs> just ashamed. And, um, you know, it totally screwed up my relationship with sex and with intimacy. And I just shoved it down so deep, man, that it actually, I, I didn't even believe it happened. It wasn't until I got into rehab and a counselor was like, you know, did you have anything in your past? And I said, no, that night I started, you know, the lid came off and like, you know, and I was waiting at this counselor's door. Like when he got to, yeah, work, like uh, yeah. he comes in and I'm like, do we need to talk? And he's like, what's up? I was like, dude, something did happen. And as we went into that, you know, this was the first kind of admittance, and then there was like, all right, well, okay, cool. That's, that's done now, right? Yeah. We're good. Now, I, it led me to this point where I had to do a lot of deep work. Yeah. And some with clinical psychologists and others with some coaches and just other people that I trusted in my life. But I, I say this sincerely. I don't believe I would have made it in the NFL had that scar not been dealt. Yeah. Because all I cared was the applause and the outward achievement. Football, school, the hottest girl, banging as many chicks as I could. Like, that was, that was how I looked to be recognized. And, you know, like a lot of us, we're trying to flex our will and show right. our ego and all these things. But it, it, it led me to achieve so much until it was the rug that was pulled out for me when football was gone. So yeah. that's obviously why it led me to coping and just numbing myself. Right. But as I've done the work, I now look back on that. And it's not in spite of that. Look at what I've achieved. It's because of that. Yeah. So there's a, almost a, a gratitude 
again, healing and, and forgiveness is, a, is, is your side of the street. Right. You can't expect others to rise up and to, you know, maybe mirror or match that. So, you know, as a kid, that was a deep wound, but it also has set me up because the work that I'm doing now, I mean, I, we talked about this a little bit at the gym. Most of those who took the oath to go and serve, they had some, you know, fucked up thing in the past. Yeah. And that was actually the thing that they said, look, I've been fucked with. I'm no longer going to be fucked with. I'm going to go and be with the most yeah, powerful it, fighting force it, in the world. It's the conduit that, that makes you challenge yourself yes. so much. Yes, exactly. And so what drove me, though, was this inner hatred. Right. It was this self-loathing. It yeah. was this like deep, like you're not worthy. Proving to yourself. That's it. Yeah. And so although it helped me to achieve really well, eventually I just felt like it was all hollow because it wasn't really for me. It's, yeah. it's this thing where like my ambitions weren't really ambitions. They were actually insecurities. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they were masked insecurities. Yeah. They were these deep seated, who the fuck am I? Yeah. I worked with a coach for about a year and a half, a brilliant man. And and it, on calls with him, I'd say like, I don't know who the fuck I am. Yeah. He'd be crying. He'd be like, hey man, congratulations. Now you get to redefine it. And it was like, I don't like this though. It doesn't yeah. feel good. It doesn't yeah, feel right. That's the hard thing is people don't know who they are. A lot of guys. I've seen a lot of guys who try and figure out who they are. You see actors. Actors who play characters for so long and then they're like, yeah. oh fuck, who am I? Jim Carrey went through a big phase of totally. like, who the fuck is he? Yeah. Like, you know, he's yeah. just a guy that makes someone laugh but no, there's a real human in there. And he's yeah. he's got to find it. Yeah, no, McConaughey, I think in that same vein, I mean, he talks about kind of, you know, he was the rom-com guy. Yeah. And at some point, it's like, I don't want to be that guy anymore. Yeah. But the world knows you as that so you start making other movies and people are like, yeah, you suck now. Yeah, well, it's yeah, because like, that's, that, that's all they know him as and, it, and yeah. there was no reach. There was, as an actor, like, yeah. yeah, he wasn't using his creativity anymore. He was just kind yep. of following the mold. Yep. So, yeah, man, so that was, that was a, a real low for me. Um, but it's also something that as, as I've worked through it and, and also kind of healed with my family, mm -hmm. you know, I think, I think, you know, my, my parents certainly felt like, what could they have done to, yeah. there's nothing There right. really sincerely yeah. is nothing. You know, I was looking for my dad to have that goodwill hunting moment, right. you know, that's right. not your fault. And I harbored some resentment for not getting that for a while. Yeah. And it wasn't until, and I'll be real with you growing up in church, you weren't supposed to be mad at God, yeah. right? Like what in the Christian faith that I grew up in, it was like, God it's all for his purpose. Like, don't ask questions. Don't, you know, don't get emotional. Don't get mad at it. Just trust. Yeah. And it wasn't until I had it out with God. And, and what the visual that I give here is like, you know, if your son, like he was trying to punch you, you just put your hand on his head and you know, yeah. he'd do this for as long as he could. And then eventually he'd be so tired. And you'd be like, you ready to listen? And what I heard God say sincerely was, if you're not being honest about how this hurt you, I can't heal you. And dude, that night, so for about two years, I had a dream every night, a nightmare that I killed my, my father, my earthly father by punching, murdering, just killed him to death by freaking punches or choking him to death. And the second that I had it out with God, finally, all of those dreams stopped that night. It stopped. I mean, I know exactly where I was in New York before a big JP Morgan speech the next morning. And I just, it was, I was free. And that goes back to like freedom from then it was freedom for, for what? And I came and gave a speech that I didn't have scripted at all. And I promise it was the best speech of my life because what people felt was the freedom for the purpose of sharing that honest truth. I shared about all of that. The abuse, that was my first time sharing it on stage. Dude, I, it was one of those like Will Ferrell old school like blackout <laughs> moments where you're like, you know, where, where I, and I came down and dude, I, I, the amount of people that came up to me and said some, some of the most sincere things it was like, man, that again, this goes back to your superpower is actually that vulnerability and the ability to share those scars. Yeah. So. Damn. Yeah. What was your favorite NFL uh, memory? I thought I was going to be Jerry Rice. Uh, yeah, I remember going to Universal Studios as a kid and they had like, you could put your face on somebody in like the magazine cover, which was funny because Jerry Rice is black and my face is white <laughs> like, in the picture. Uh, but this is going to sound crazy. Maybe this was my delusions of grandeur because of the trauma and the pain that I yeah. was in. But I always knew I was going to make it to the NFL. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't say that with arrogance because on paper, nothing validated that. But it was like, and maybe that was just my lifeline. That was like thinking about my way out. I had to do that. There was no other way. Um, but I, I think that the sort of sell the farm mentality was... I don't know, me finding a way to, you know, be on the hero's journey, like the movies we saw growing up, the yeah. Rudy's, the remember the yeah. Titans, the like, all of that was like gladiator and all these things. Like that's how I envisioned myself. And so once I started to realize that like, 
man, it's not so much trying to be like someone. You just got to be your own version of that. Then suddenly the fruits of that started to pour from a full cup. It wasn't just like I was doing it to, to be seen yeah. or doing it because I deserved it somehow. There wasn't like a, any need for it on the identity side. It was just like, man, this is what I know my best and highest use is. And that's the place that I try to live today. I'm certainly not perfect at it. I don't have all the answers, but I'm willing to wade into the water with you and we can learn how to swim together. It's not standing on the shore and being like, hey, man, you got this. Like, yeah. I believe in going deep with people, getting your hands dirty and being willing to sit in the mess because their mess is my mess and my mess is their mess. I may not take theirs home with me. I've gotten yeah. smarter about that. <laughs> but it's it's also like, man, I think that elite trust is only earned when you're able to lay your sword down and then they have permission to do it too. Love that. So your favorite memory in the NFL was? Man, favorite in the NFL? Sorry, I thought you meant favorite t uh, player growing up. No, good. Um, yeah. So, no, my favorite play in the NFL. So, uh, my first ever sack, we were playing the Seahawks uh, when I was with the Rams. It was the first time they ever did the pink breast cancer awareness, oh, like yeah. gloves and cleats and stuff. And I sacked Hasselback, and on the play, it was a pick six, and we ended up winning the game. Front page of the paper the next day in St. Louis uh, Post Tribune was, you know, me like, ah, like screaming oh, after the play. Oh, that's badass. And it just, it, it felt like, I guess I, I kind of, even though I was in, I was in the NFL and, and had reached that stage, I didn't feel, I never believed I could be that type of breakthrough player. Yeah. And then you, you have a play like that, or, you know, you block a punt we win the game, you get player of the game and you're holding a game ball, like holding a freaking game ball that says my name on it yeah. of player of the game. Dude, that, that's yeah. like crack, man. Like, yeah. You just can't. Yeah. I mean, again, I couldn't imagine stepping outside the wire. I'll kid it up. Uh, the adrenaline and just the fact that you're with your boys because yeah, suiting up at football was special. We uh, in in Mosul 2005, we actually had it like a I was I don't know how to, I don't know how to term this, but like a mission complete. We went there to, but when we got there, the officer had a you know poster on the wall of the center guy that we're trying to go after and all the guys connected to him. And by the time we left there, we caught that dude. It was like crazy i remember the night we caught him and it was like oh shit like bad like i don't know i, I thought maybe everyone experiences then later finally like not everyone goes to that right like we did that and I'd it was very few actually very few and so it's a really cool feeling and um you know you get like a little awards and all that stuff the the, the the battalion gets award for it and everything but it was crazy that was the one thing where i was like damn that's like our touchdown in freaking combat was yeah. that yeah. you know what i mean or here's yeah. a question do you ever because again i i there's certainly good memories yeah. in the league but I've, I remember more of the tackles I missed, more of the plays that I, right? Yeah. Is, was there some of that too where it's, it's, it's much about, you know, not, not discounting those, those wins or yeah. those successes, but do you, did you feel like you were always more focused on those things that were too close of a call or too bad of a thing that you like could have course corrected? I think those are all the memories that you hold on to. Yeah. I mean, all the things that I've done work on is, you know, uh, the collateral damage of war that you don't expect, right? Um, Survivor guilt. Yeah, all those things. I think that's what is just hung up on. Uh, you don't ever talk too often about the success of our missions, right? We do a lot of cool missions. We catch a lot of good dudes. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, it is what it is. It's what we're meant to do. I guess because it's what you're expected to do. Yeah, the standards. Right. That, yeah. yeah. Like, you don't talk about the, there's a lot of weird shit that happens on missions that are kind of funny and you like, you, you laugh at them later, but you're like, that's not how it's that supposed to go. Yeah, yeah, it's not like, supposed yeah. to go like that, yeah. dude. I, Will Chesney, good bud, he was the dog handler on Bin Laden. Yeah. And, you know, he, he when they talk about obviously the bird going down and like all that, so like, that was not part of the mission. Right. Brief, right and yet it actually worked to their favor because yeah. the guys had punched through and blown that door and then it was like hey guys do you guys want to come in here you know what <laughs> yeah. I mean? they like timed up perfect so i think but that again back to how we started this conversation with veterans listening the skills that you you the decisions that you made under stress right to adapt and overcome mm -hmm. and evolve that mission or evolve those orders like you are absolutely capable of doing that yeah like don't let that voice in your head convince you that those days are done you yeah. know, like you probably see things with x-ray vision. You just yet have yet to find an arena where you can produce that or provide that value with consistency. How, how would you, uh, that's a good point. How would you help someone find their next purpose? Like, how do you, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the answer. I always tell people to try it all. Actually, this is kind of cool. I use this with a veteran who's in our current class. Um, cool army vet. He, so he, he's struggling with this exact question. And I had him write down three people that if he could, you know, have dinner with, like whether he knew him or not, 
Right. Um, you know, they have three, three people and then you write down the three attributes that you most respect about those three people. Right. So like maybe one of them is Jesus and you're, you're yeah. writing that stuff down, you know, maybe it's your dad, maybe it's your commanding officer, whatever it is. And so you have three people and nine collective descriptors of those people. Nice. Then you have one person that you identify, like if that person came in right now, like I'd have to hold you back, you would fight them. Oh, really? Like you wouldn't piss on them if they're on yeah, fire. It's called fight dude, on right? sight. That's <laughs> it. And then you list the three attributes that you despise in them. Right. Yeah. You absolutely hate. Then as we look at these nine attributes and these three attributes of that, that negative person, the truth is, is the person who's stuck, they actually relate more to that person that they have absolute hatred for and the attributes associated to that. That's what their little voice in their head constantly orbits uh, is those attributes, right? It's like that it's, negative psychology. Yeah. Well, it's transference. So, so what you see in someone else that bothers you, that's actually your stuff, man. Mm. Right. And so what we do is, and now we go, Hey, listen, you're actually way more of these nine attributes than you give yourself credit for. But then with those nine attributes, how, how are you living out with integrity? Then he, the person answers that stuff. So we use those nine positive attributes to then work from those and say, man, if you were a little bit more like Jesus, how would that look like in your day to day? If you're a little bit like Rocco and how he's been successful in all these things, what would that look like? Then we put a plan in place to say, okay, there's a roadmap based around these people, but at some point you're going to come at a fork in the road where it's, you can't repeat what they've done because you're not them. Yeah. Now you have to make it yours. Yeah. So I think that that is a really cool exercise. And then also just, again, you know, for me, like the weight room, you know, the gym, a strength yeah. and conditioning program was always like, you know, a, an equation that was familiar. And it was like X and Y equals Z if I work hard enough. Right. So I used an arena like the gym that was like, man, if I can use that to empower other people, then I could probably create some good business. Right. Um, you know, maybe that's look, maybe, it, it, you know, there was something in cancer in your life and that's where, you know, you find a, a, a large emotional and spiritual energy behind doing work and not worrying about who gets the credit. Maybe nonprofit work, maybe not, but it's recognizing systems that exist and seeing how your personal story can integrate into that to elevate the value that it's providing or the commodity that it's positioning. I mean, dude, like the, the black rifle coffee thing, I know I, I mentioned it earlier. Yeah. Like, it, it's, it's a bunch of dudes. You guys all served together. Yeah. Right. It's a bunch of dudes that were passionate about, yeah, coffee, but like really it wasn't that it was the culture. Yeah. So I'll explain a little bit more. Yeah, I don't, please. I don't own black rifle coffee. They do. They do. But those are my boys. We started article 15 clothing together. It was actually okay. Matt and JT. Yep. Yep. And then they invited me. And it, so the crazy story about it all is that what we created was a friendship and the friendship that like was, was recorded and yep. we made these stupid skits created like, a revenue stream for us yep. by selling t-shirts. And then we owned a, uh, it's actually how I got into acting is we owned a, a whiskey company and then we decided we wanted to produce a movie. Yep. And that was like this really crazy, very attractive to uh, the outside, outside people watching. Yep. They were like, these guys look like fun. Yep. And like, they remind me of my friends yep. and shit, I'm going to support them. Yep. And so, Yep. You know, they went and did Black Rifle Coffee. I went off and did the Hollywood thing. And, you know, that's, that's the history of how it goes. But, yeah, it came down to us just finding ourselves between ourselves. I found myself through that, through yeah. the YouTube, you know, and yeah. they found their business through the same kind of thing. Yeah. You know, I just followed my passion. They followed theirs. And, and But point being is this day and age, everybody's got a phone. And the ability yeah. to put things and content out, if you're going to be you, there's some people are, it's going to resonate with someone. Yeah, and absolutely. Then, and then through that, like if you can be a value, maybe that's in a coaching sense, or maybe that's because you stamped this product that has been really critical to you. I, I, I say this as an entrepreneur, I call it the Laird Hamilton model. Laird being, you know, legendary big wave surfer and incredible extreme mm, athlete. Man. Laird said, okay, I like doing these things, but they're costing me money. Let's make them not cost anything. Step one. Yeah. Step two is, man, now that that doesn't cost me anything, what if my affiliations with these people and otherwise, what if they could actually pay me? And I'm already doing the things I was already doing. Yeah. But now all of a sudden I have a stream of income, stream of revenue from that. Yeah. Then eventually he goes, like, maybe I could just start my own right? Yeah. Coffee creamer, my own greens product, my own whatever, rather than those people just paying him a part of it. Yeah. So then he just took it from one to two to three, but, yeah. but you have to do one and two before you get to three. Absolutely. Most do at least. Right. 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 right, right. So the idea of positioning who you are and what you believe in and the things that you like doing, present those to the world. 
then figure out a way that you create a revenue stream and then figure out a way that you end up, you know, running or owning a business that is in the same vein of all the things you like to do. Hence the Vinny Rock podcast. Hey, <laughs> here we are. Yeah, I, I mean, I created this to be able to talk to the friends and people who have impacted my life that I, I think have awesome stories to tell the world. Yeah. And it's like, I like to just talk about it. You know what I mean? And, and a lot of my sponsors are people that are personal friends of mine that believe in what the mission is, right? right. The mission is just to tell the story, to, uh, to let people uh, inspire, motivate, and entertain, right? That's yeah. the kind of the three things that kind of fall off. Yeah. And as long as I'm inspiring, motivating, and entertaining, I feel like I'm always going to be right with, with, with who I am and what I want to represent to the world. You know, yeah. God, family, country, yeah. entertain, inspire, and, and, and motivate. Yeah. So, Do you find that, you know, people gravitate more to the, like what you would consider entertain first? That kind of gets them into the... It's how I think I built my platform originally, but I got really tired of the feeling of like dance for me monkey kind of uh, thing, right? Yeah. People, you, they see you at a bar like, oh, bro, do this thing. And you're like, no. oh, bro, I don't want to do that. And, and still to this day, like there's people that come up and they're not kind of respectful towards the craft of acting more so like yeah. they, they like throw jabs and it's like, all right, cool. That's how you want to communicate. It's like, hey, fucker, buy yeah, me a yeah, beard, yeah, that yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, you're like... Yeah. Oh, but, this guy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And it's like, dude, you know, I'm a human being, motherfucker. Yeah, I got my, yeah. I'm, I'm a family yeah. here. A little respect, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. But um, I think I've been very cognizant about how I manage my social media and being very human on social media. Uh, yeah, and, and I think that's helped kind of people know like, oh, he's pretty human. Like, I'm not going to bother him. Like, I don't yeah. think... I think people look at me and like I'm I'm attainable and good. Yep. I want them to feel the way. So it's yep. not this big, oh my god. Like yep. no, like they can message me all day. I, I'll I'll text call whatever. It doesn't matter yep. because I don't find that what I do is that great of a thing when it comes to like oh you're in Hollywood you're an actor. It's like I'm a, it's a job. It pays my bills. Like what I like to do is this right. What I like to do is is the lightness, uh, the the light diffuse retreats and help people yep. and and show them a path. What I do on film and television, it's therapeutic for myself. You know what I mean. And as well as it pays the bills for the family and. Hopefully, I can use that muse to write stories that I find to be valuable for 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 influence. You You're know? also connecting with people that do have other platforms and otherwise. And so, if you were just locked in this room, yeah. even even hosting awesome people, it would still limit right. Rocco going out and acting. Rocco will be right. being in these because there's going to be certain people in trailers that they don't approach it with authenticity. Yeah, they aren't pretending to be human they're 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 little g god in their own life yeah and so i think that's also why hollywood's like we like this guy yeah there's I, something different about yeah, i hope man that's what yeah. i hope man i think look it hasn't slowed me down i'll yeah. tell you that you know i'm i'm good with building relationships i'm good to people you know they they know i'm grounded in like my family is more than anything and so i think that shows someone they can rely on right i'm reliability is important in, in that industry yeah. Um, and so I'm just trying to continue to keep up with that and keep them yeah. proud. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's a fucking different world, dog. Like yeah. I like your world. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I, as a wife, like I'd love to just like run a gym. I'm just not, I'm not, that's not my world in a sense. Like I love going to the gym if yeah. I had time. I'm that guy. Like if I have time, sure. right. Which I'm trying to change that for my own <laughs> self. But like for me, it's like, I love to create, you know what I mean? I love to, to help. Right. I love to just just be there for people. You know what you know? I love is alchemy. I believe in miracles happening right now in this exact moment. And if you attune to what's happening with that sort of like spiritual plane, yeah, I think that you recognize and can manifest so many things that it's a law of attraction thing, right? Like yeah. if you're head down, eyes closed, woe is me, victim mentality, you can't see what's right in front of you. Right. You can't catch it. It'll hit you right in the face and be like, oh, there, life life hit me again. Yeah. Right? Where it's like, nah, man. In fact, if you just would broaden your vision, your left and right lateral limits to recognize that everything's for you and there may be a lot of God winks that are sitting right in front of you. The alchemy, the base metals into gold, what is the key factor? Heat. It's heat, man. Yeah. Heat is the defining factor. So if you're not living a life, maybe it's the gym, maybe it's not the gym, but if you're not turning up the heat for personal growth in areas of your life that you can control, yeah, like life provides a curriculum. It's going to slap you around. It's going to give you all kinds of stuff, but it's about forging your flag in the ground, your understanding of yourself and how you relate to adversity, difficulty, and that heat. That's going to allow you to then be calm, cool, and collected when life slaps you around. Yeah, And I think that's the part, I don't know, that's the part that, it's not head knowledge, right? It has to be like that knowledge to create it into wisdom. It has to be applied, lived and embodied. Yeah. Once you start to do that, then all of a sudden, man, you realize people can offend you. Yeah. Right. People can, people can say what they want and you're like, Hey man, all good. Yeah. Right? 
respect. There's nothing you're going to tell me because I know why I'm on this path. And that best and highest use for me is being lived out. Even you coming up to try to like stir shit and otherwise yeah. proves that I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. Yeah. Fuck. What's the future hold for you? What, what's the plans? Yeah. So, uh, you know, my gym is currently in a 20,000 square foot facility that we lease. Um, we're working in combination with this guy named Dak Prescott. You may have heard of him. Dak has become an amazing friend and uh, supporter of our foundation. So he's actually going to make a large, large contribution. We're going to buy some land and we're going to build a, a 15 to $20 million campus Dope. that we own that will involve housing, not just for the athletes that we bring in to participate in that nine week program, but for elite athletes too. So we're bringing back what I started with. And so, yeah, man, Dak is going to be like, Hey, you know, to somebody without legs, like when you're done with that dumbbell, can I get that? Like, That's cool. Oh, shit. <laughs> right? So here locally in Dallas, Fort Worth, it's that and create a, a growth model where we can replicate. Cool. Um, beyond that, you know, I'm, I'm working on my own podcast. Cool. So Chris Long, teammate of mine, runs Greenlight Podcast. Under his franchise, I'm, I'm launching the Life After Podcast. Dope. So life-altering moments come in many forms, but they always come. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the first ones that I did, it's not out yet, but the DOC, so Doc, you know, one of the original members of NWA yeah. ends up leaving his teeth wrapped in a tree in a car accident, crushes his vocal cords instantly. His voice becomes like a monster. Can't rap. He, he for 30 years, tries to get back to who he was the day before the accident. Damn. Lives with Dr. Dre for 30 years. Like Snoop Dogg doesn't exist if DOC's voice is okay. Like no. Put that in your pipe Damn. and smoke it, bro. Like, <laughs> I'm sitting with DOC and he's talking about how how God ordained all of this. It just took him 30, 33 years to realize it, dude. And he's telling stories like one night, fun story, dude. I'm, I'm, I grew up West coast, like love gangster yep. rap. Yep. Like, you know, in my world, in the locker room, like I was the minority, yeah. right. In yeah. football. And I love that. Like yeah. it wasn't, you know, when people talk about this, otherwise in the, a lot of the social injustices, just like, I learned so much from dudes that were a Juco transfer that grew up in fifth ward yeah. and anyone in a uniform was the enemy. Right. And yep. like, there were some rich conversations inside of the locker room. Anyway, the, the point being is, you know, I think the, uh, the difference between people who um, have a growth mindset and a fixed mindset is everything. The only disability is that fixed mindset. Right. You know, um, I'm trying to think down where I was back to the story there. I got off in the weeds. Well, yeah, the, the, the doc. Has oh, DOC. Sorry. So doc. So Dre calls him. It's like 2 a.m. Dre calls DOC at Dre's house. Says, get to the studio. He says, Man, I'm tired. I'm not. You know, I should get to the studio. Doc gets there. Dre doesn't say a word to him. He just pushes play. Doc said he listens to the best rapper he's ever heard. And then Dre pauses it, looks at him, and holds up a picture. And it's a white dude. That's how they met Eminem. Oh, shit. And I'm like, Ooh, you know, I like dude. So I'm sitting here like, wow. So anyway, the life after pod is really just, you know, there'll be some big names, but other people cool. that you're like, man, this person just has a wowing story of overcoming. And, and how do they give nuggets to the audience yeah. to share some of that? So cool. the big campus project, the big podcast, you know, for me, those are opportunities like you. Like I, I, I've, I'm privileged to know a lot of really, really cool people and be yeah. connected with cool people. So to use the stories less about what they're known for in, yeah. in pop culture, in the world, right. more about like, you know, what, what has been their secret sauce or secret power when stuff hits the fan? This is super dope, man. Yeah. Bro, I'm excited, man. We're at an hour. We'll shut this bad boy down. Yeah, we dude. can go for a while. Huh? Yeah, we can. No, I love it though, man. I it's I think there's gonna be a lot of nuggets in here that people are gonna have value in, and I appreciate that, I dude. Hope so, man. Well, I hope we can get get you back in the gym. Maybe we'll do a life after pod, and we can reverse. I'm, I'm reverse down, the seats bro. Here, I'm man. down, man. I just started getting back into it. I'm down like ten pounds and shit. So yeah, it's buddy. a process, man. I just gotta get my head wrapped around it, dog. It's like Hollywood is a. Uh, motivates me because like the better in shape I get I think I can get more opportunities and and so that's kind of like I, I'm stealing food from my own kid's mouth and not get my fucking ass in the gym dude so well, we're here for you brother yeah, whenever man. yeah anything else you want to plug anything social no, media man, I, I think you know the the bigger why here is you know uh it, shout out to my wife because <laughs> you know the night that I got to speak at your at your uh, light the fuse event uh we had no kids we had three young kids and so we we had a date night planned and when Flo called me, Flo is a deep friend of mine, plus board member of my foundation. He said, bro, I, you know, Rock, Rocco needs you. So I went to my wife and I'm like trying to approach it. You know, like, <laughs> hey, baby, you know I might only be gone for a little bit. But, and she knows who she married. Right? Yeah. She says, you need to go, go. So one shout out to Sarah Vibora. I love you. But two, it goes back to, again, had I not done that, yeah. right? at some point we probably would have connected, yeah. but maybe not in the same way. Maybe right. we're not sitting right here being able to present this. So don't let the voice in your head 
talk you out of taking a step toward connecting with people because you might just find that, you know, you thought you were coming to give something and actually you came to receive, man. And that's, that's exactly our story. Beautiful. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Yeah.